Jeanette Pickering Rankin June 11, 1880, to May 18, 1973, was an American politician and women's rights advocate, and the first woman to hold federal office in the United States. She was elected to the U.S. House of Representatives by the state of Montana in 1916, and again in 1940. She remains the only woman elected to Congress from Montana. Each of Rankin's congressional terms coincided with initiation of U.S. military intervention in each of the two world wars. A lifelong pacifist and a supporter of non-interventionism, she was one of 50 House members, along with six senators, who opposed the War Declaration of 1917, and the only member of Congress to vote against declaring war on Japan after the attack on Pearl Harbor in 1941. A progressive era member of the Republican Party, Rankin was also instrumental in initiating the legislation that eventually became the 19th Constitutional Amendment, granting unrestricted voting rights to women. In her victory speech, she recognized the power she held being the only woman able to vote in Congress, saying, I am deeply conscious of the responsibility resting upon me. She championed the causes of gender equality and civil rights throughout a career that spanned more than six decades. <laughs> Early life Rankin was born on June 11, 1880, near Missoula, Montana, nine years before the territory became a state, to schoolteacher Olive Pickering and Scottish-Canadian immigrant John Rankin, who worked as a carpenter and rancher. She was the eldest of six children, including five girls one of whom died in childhood and one brother, Wellington, who would become the state's attorney general, and later, an associate justice of the Montana Supreme Court. As an adolescent, Rankin held many responsibilities including cleaning, sewing, farm chores, outdoor work, and helping care for her younger siblings. She helped maintain the ranch machinery, and once single-handedly built a wooden sidewalk for a building owned by her father so that it could be rented. Rankin later recorded her childhood observation that while women of the 1890s Western frontier labored side by side with the men as equals, they did not have an equal political voice—nor a legal right to vote. Montana, with its sawtooth mountains and vast prairies, did much to shape her, yet she had a lifelong love-hate affair with the state. Go! 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 She wrote in an early journal, It makes no difference where just so you go. Go! Go, remember at the first opportunity, go. Rankin graduated from high school in 1898, and from the University of Montana in 1902 with a Bachelor of Science degree in biology. Before her political and advocacy career, she first explored a variety of careers including dressmaking, furniture design, and teaching. <laughs> Activism and suffrage movement At the age of 27, Rankin moved to San Francisco to take a job in social work. Confident that she had found her calling, she enrolled in the New York School of Philanthropy in New York City later part of Columbia University School of Social Work from 1908 to 1909. She then moved to Spokane, Washington, where, after briefly serving as a social worker, she attended the University of Washington and became involved in the women's suffrage movement. She helped organize the New York Women's Suffrage Party and worked as a lobbyist for the National American Woman Suffrage Association NAWSA. In November 1910, Washington voters approved an amendment to their state constitution permanently enfranchising women, the fifth state in the Union to do so. In February 1911, Rankin became the first woman to speak before the Montana legislature, making her case for women's suffrage. By implementing a grassroots organizing strategy, Rankin was able to urge Montana to pass an amendment granting women unrestricted voting rights in November 1914. Later, this infrastructure helped her congressional campaign, ultimately resulting in an electoral victory. Rankin later compared her work in the women's suffrage movement to the pacifist foreign policy that defined her congressional career. She believed, with many suffragists of the period, that the corruption and dysfunction of the United States government was a result of a lack of feminine participation. As she said at a disarmament conference in the interwar period, the peace problem is a woman's problem. <laughs> House of Representatives First congressional term 
Rankin's campaign for one of Montana's two at-large House seats in the congressional election of 1916 was financed and managed by her brother Wellington, an influential member of the Montana Republican Party. The campaign involved traveling long distances to reach the state's widely scattered population. Rankin rallied support at train stations, street corners, potluck suppers on ranches, and remote one-room schoolhouses. She was elected on November 7, by a margin of over 7,500 votes, to become the first female member of Congress. Shortly after her term began, Congress was called into an extraordinary April session in response to Germany's declaration of unrestricted submarine warfare on all Atlantic shipping. On April 2, 1917, President Woodrow Wilson, addressing a joint session, asked Congress to make the world safe for democracy by declaring war on Germany. After intense debate, the war resolution came to a vote in the House at 3 o'clock in the morning on April 6. Rankin cast one of 50 votes in opposition. I wish to stand for my country, she said, but I cannot vote for war. Years later, she would add, I felt the first time the first woman had a chance to say no to war, she should say it. Although 49 male representatives and six senators joined her in voting against the declaration, Rankin was singled out for criticism. Some considered her vote to be a discredit to the suffragist movement and to her authority in Congress, but others applauded it, including Alice Paul of the National Woman's Party and Representative Fiorello LaGuardia of New York. On June 8, 1917, the Speculator Mine disaster in Butte left 168 miners dead, and a massive protest strike over working conditions ensued. Rankin intervened, but mining companies refused to meet with her or the miners, and proposed legislation was unsuccessful. By 1917, women had been granted some form of voting rights in about 40 states, but Rankin became a driving force in the movement for unrestricted universal enfranchisement. She was instrumental in the creation of the Committee on Woman Suffrage, and became one of its founding members. In January 1918, the committee delivered its report to Congress, and Rankin opened congressional debate on a constitutional amendment granting universal suffrage to women. The resolution passed in the House but was defeated by the Senate. In 1919, a similar resolution passed both chambers. After ratification by three fourths of the states, it became the 19th Amendment to the United States Constitution. During Rankin's term, the Montana State Legislature voted to replace the state's two at large seats with two separate districts, and Rankin found herself in the overwhelmingly Democratic Western District. With little chance of retaining her House seat after the reapportionment, she opted to run for the Senate in 1918. After losing the Republican primary to Oscar M. Landstrom, she accepted the nomination of the National Party, and finished third in the general election behind incumbent Democrat Thomas J. Walsh and Landstrom. Between terms In 1924, Rankin bought a small farm in Georgia where she lived a simple life without electricity or plumbing. She made frequent speeches around the country on behalf of the Women's Peace Union and the National Council for the Prevention of War. In 1928 she founded the Georgia Peace Society, which served as headquarters for her pacifism campaign until its demise in 1941. On the eve of World War II, she also worked as a field secretary for the National Consumers League, and as a lobbyist for various pacifist organizations. She argued for the passage of a constitutional amendment banning child labor, and supported the Shepherd Towner Act, the first federal social welfare program created explicitly for women and children. The legislation was enacted in 1921 but repealed just eight years later. <laughs> Second congressional term Rankin won election to the House once again in 1940, at the age of 60, defeating incumbent Jacob Thorkelson, an outspoken antisemite, in the July primary, and former Representative Jerry J. O'Connell in the general election. She was appointed to the Committee on Public Lands and the Committee on Insular Affairs, while members of Congress—and their constituents— had been debating the question of U.S. intervention in World War II for months. The attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941, galvanized the country and silenced virtually all opposition. On December 8, Rankin was the only member of either House of Congress to vote against the declaration of war on Japan. 
Hisses could be heard in the gallery as she cast the vote. Several colleagues, including Rep. later Senator Everett Dirksen, asked her to change it to make the resolution unanimous or at very least, to abstain but she refused. As a woman, I can't go to war, she said, and I refuse to send anyone else. After the vote, a crowd of reporters pursued Rankin into a cloakroom, where she was forced to take refuge in a phone booth until Capitol Police arrived to escort her to her office. There, she was inundated with angry telegrams and phone calls, including one from her brother, who said, Montana is 100% against you. Rankin refused to apologize. Everyone knew that I was opposed to the war, and they elected me. She said, I voted as the mothers would have had me vote. A wire service photo of Rankin sequestered in the phone booth, calling for assistance, appeared the following day in newspapers across the country. While her action was widely ridiculed in the press, William Allen White, writing in the Kansas Emporia Gazette, acknowledged her courage in taking it. Probably a hundred men in Congress would have liked to do what she did. Not one of them had the courage to do it. The Gazette entirely disagrees with the wisdom of her position. But Lord, it was a brave thing and its bravery some way discounted its folly. When, in a hundred years from now, courage, sheer courage based upon moral indignation is celebrated in this country, the name of Jeanette Rankin, who stood firm in folly for her faith, will be written in monumental bronze, not for what she did, but for the way she did it. Two days later, a similar war declaration against Germany and Italy came to a vote, Rankin abstained. Her political career effectively over, she did not run for re-election in 1942. Asked years later if she had ever regretted her action, Rankin replied, never. If you're against war, you're against war regardless of what happens. It's a wrong method of trying to settle a dispute. <laughs> later life Over the next 20 years Rankin traveled the world, frequently visiting India, where she studied the pacifist teachings of Mahatma Gandhi. In the 1960s and 1970s a new generation of pacifists, feminists, and civil rights advocates found inspiration in Rankin, and embraced her efforts in ways that her own generation had not. The Vietnam War mobilized her once again. In January 1968, the Jeanette Rankin Brigade, a coalition of women's peace groups, organized an anti-war march in Washington, D.C. The largest march by women since the Woman Suffrage Parade of 1913. Rankin led 5,000 participants from Union Station to the steps of the Capitol building, where they presented a peace petition to House Speaker John McCormick. Simultaneously, a splinter group of activists from the Women's Liberation Movement created a protest within the brigade's protest by staging a burial of true womanhood at Arlington National Cemetery to draw attention to the passive role allotted to women as wives and mothers. In 1972, Rankin by then in her 90s, considered mounting a third House campaign to gain a wider audience for her opposition to the Vietnam War, but long-standing throat and heart ailments forced abandonment of that final project. <laughs> Personal life Jeanette Rankin never married. While she maintained a lifelong, close friendship with the noted journalist and author Catherine Anthony, both women were never romantically involved. Anthony's life partner was educator Elizabeth Irwin, founder of the Little Red School House in New York City. Rankin's biographers disagree on her specific sexual orientation, but generally agree that she was too consumed by her work to pursue stable personal relationships. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Death and Legacy. Rankin died on May 18, 1973, age 92, in Carmel, California. She bequeathed her estate, including the property in Watkinsville, Georgia, to help mature, unemployed women workers. The Jeanette Rankin Foundation, now the Jeanette Rankin Women's Scholarship Fund, a 501c3 nonprofit organization, awards annual educational scholarships to low-income women 35 and older across the United States. Beginning with a single $500 scholarship in 1978, the fund has since awarded more than $1.8 million in scholarships to more than 700 women. A statue of Rankin, inscribed, I cannot vote for war, was placed in the United States Capitol's Statuary Hall in 1985. 
At its dedication, historian Joan Hoff Wilson called Rankin, "...one of the most controversial and unique women in Montana and American political history." A replica stands in Montana's Capitol building in Helena. In 1993, Rankin was inducted into the National Women's Hall of Fame. In 2004, peace activist Jean Marie Simpson produced and starred in the one woman play A Single Woman, based on the life of Rankin. Simpson baked bread during each performance and distributed it to audience members as the show concluded. She performed the play 263 times over two years in the U.S. and abroad to benefit peace organizations and movements including the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, the American Civil Liberties Union, and the American Friends Service Committee. Simpson then wrote and starred in a film biography of Rankin, also titled A Single Woman, directed and produced by Kamala Lopez, narrated by Martin Sheen, and featuring music by Joni Mitchell. In 2017, the first Jeanette Rankin Legacy Lecture was presented. It was by Sarah Hayden, a University of Montana communications professor, and was given at the University of Georgia. Also in 2017, a song cycle about Rankin called Fierce Grace premiered. This song cycle was commissioned by Opera America from four composers Ellen Reed, Kitty Brazelton, Laura Kaminsky, and Laura Karpman, and librettist Kimberly Reed. In 2018, a mural with a caricature of Rankin and a quote from Rankin stating, Go, go, go. It makes no difference where, just so you go. Go, go was painted on the side of the Kalispell Brewing Company. Although her legacy rests almost entirely on her pacifism, Rankin told the Montana Constitutional Convention in 1972 that she would have preferred otherwise. If I am remembered for no other act. She said, I want to be remembered as the only woman who ever voted to give women the right to vote. Rankin remains the only woman ever elected to Congress from Montana. Topic. See also History of the United States Republican Party List of peace activists Women's International League for Peace and Freedom Women in the United States House of Representatives Barbara Lee, the only member of Congress to vote against American military response to the September 11, 2001 terrorist attacks <laughs>